the fallen nature of Jesus Christ are linked together, that one is based upon the another, upon the other. The question is, is that correct? Is that a correct linkage, or were they wrong in that? And should we correct their mistake? That's the issue at stake. Now, I also have to say this, and I think you know it, that the issue of the fallen nature of Jesus Christ is among the most sensitive topics being addressed right now in the Seventh-day Adventist Church, perhaps second only to the tithing issue in terms of sensitivity. What we're dealing with this afternoon is in an issue which strikes nerves the wrong way. And so I'm going to ask that as we go through this, we do it with as open a mind as we possibly can, because it is in this area that many biases and many prejudices exist. With that preface, let's move directly into our topic. And I am first, before I address the topic of Jesus' fallen nature, I'm going to address the topic of Jesus' emptying just for a few moments. Would you turn to Philippians, please, chapter 2. Philippians chapter 2 and verse 5, onward. Here in this little passage, Paul is expressing the whole incarnation in just a few short verses, particularly in verse 7. I want to focus on the first half of that verse. In the King James Version, it says, He made himself of no reputation and took upon him the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of men. Now, if you have a more modern translation, you may find it translated, he emptied himself. That is what the Greek word really means. He emptied himself and took upon him the form of a servant. What is that emptying? What did he empty himself of as he came down to this earth? And I would like to suggest there are some crucial things that he emptied himself of, and I'm going to be very brief here, but they are crucial that we understand. John chapter 5 verse 30. Would you t- turn to John 5:30 with me? A very strange statement for the creator of the universe to make, for you do remember that the one who lived on this earth is the one who created this world. Jesus in the New Testament is Yahweh in the Old Testament, the creator God, the one who speaks and it is so, the one who commands and it stands fast. And in John chapter 5 verse 30 it says, I can of mine own self do nothing. As I hear, I judge, and my judgment is just because I seek not mine own will, but the will of the Father which hath sent me. I can of mine own self do nothing? A very strange statement for the creator of this universe to make, who created all things, who brought all things into existence by the power that was within himself. Put together with that Desire of Ages, page 336, when in that little boat on the Sea of Galilee, He rested not in the possession of almighty power. It was not as the master of earth and sea and sky that he reposed in quiet. That power he had laid down. And he says, I can of mine own self do nothing. He trusted in the Father's might. It was in faith, faith in in God's love and care that Jesus rested. And the power of that word which stilled the storm was the power of God. That power, his own power, he had laid down, and now he trusted in his father's power. In page, on page 133 of the same book, Desire of Ages, the miracles of Christ for the afflicted and suffering were wrought by the power of God through the ministration of angels. That's how he did his miracles. Not by his own power as God, that power he had laid down. Now he uses his father's power as an instrument as he is able to use it for the, for the healing of mankind and even to the resurrection of the dead. So number one is omnipotence. He empties himself of, he does not use during his life on earth in any miracle that he does, either for others' good or for his Father's glory. Second, what about his memory? In Luke 2.52, we read that Jesus increased in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and man. It's easy to imagine Jesus growing up as a boy. It's a little harder to imagine Jesus increasing in wisdom, isn't it? Because he is omniscient. Or is he? Is he truly omniscient as a child and a young man on this earth? Desire of Ages, page 70, the very words which he himself had spoken to Moses for Israel, he was now taught at his mother's knee. He had to learn the Ten Commandments. 
stumbling at first, learning them better each time, just the way you learn them. And he had given the Ten Commandments. Desire of Ages, again, page 70. He who had made all things studied the lessons which his own hand had written in earth and sea and sky. Can't you imagine the day the little child Jesus came running into his mother from outside after a, a powerful rainstorm had washed the earth and says, Mother, what is that in the sky? And his mother had to tell him about the rainbow that he had placed in the sky as a promise that the earth would never again be destroyed by a flood. Can we understand what that means? Jesus did not live his life on earth on the basis of his memory of the past. That was gone. That's the second thing. The third thing. Mark chapter 13, verse 32. Mark 13, 32. Please look at that for a moment. One of those strange passages, especially in light of the whole chapter. The whole chapter is a description of the events to come after he would finish his ministry until the second coming. And in verse 32, he has come to the time of the second coming. And he says, Of that day and that hour knoweth no man... No, not the angels which are in heaven, neither the Son, but the Father. How can Jesus say that? He has just finished telling us about all the things that will occur down through centuries of time. He has told us that the sun will be darkened. And now he says, I can't tell you when I'm coming again. You see, he can reveal to us what the Father had revealed to him. But what the Father did not reveal was not in his power to give. Desire of Ages, page 147. Before he came to earth, the plan lay out before him, perfect in all its detail. He saw it all. But as he walked among men, he was guided step by step by the Father's will. His ministry of healing, page 479. Christ, in his life on earth, made no plans for himself. He accepted God's plans for him, and day by day the Father unfolded his plan. Do you know what he was doing during those nights of prayer? He was getting tomorrow's agenda. He was asking, Father, where do we go tomorrow? Who do we talk to? What shall I say? How can I vindicate your name? And the Father would reveal it. And when the Father did not reveal it, he could not say. Because he was dependent upon his Father's knowledge, not his own. One more that's a powerful statement from Desire of Ages 753. The Savior could not see through the portals of the tomb. That's when he's hanging on the cross. Hope did not present to him as coming forth from the grave a conqueror or tell him of the Father's acceptance of the sacrifice. Now, I wish I could spend the next hour just on that one passage because what that is saying is that Jesus, as a man dying on the cross, separated from the Father because of sin, is fearful that it is all coming to naught, that the whole thing is failing, that he will never see his Father's face again, and he will never rise from the tomb. That's his feeling. And you know the battle Jesus has to fight? The battle of, failing, of, faith, of faith and feeling. Faith in his Father's word versus his own feeling that it is all coming to nothing. And essentially Jesus is saying to his Father, I am willing to die eternally if that is necessary for the vindication of your name. That's the death Jesus is dying on the cross. A willingness to die forever if that will save mankind and vindicate the Father. I can't spend any more time on that passage, unfortunately. Please study it some more and meditate on the implications of that. But it certainly says that Jesus as a man does not see through with the eye of foreknowledge. He does not have foreknowledge on this earth. He does not see through those doors of the tomb they look shut to him because of sin that is resting upon him. And so his eyesight is limited to the sight of faith, not knowledge. That's the third thing, foreknowledge of the future. The fourth thing I won't even take time to read any text for because it is so obvious. The fourth is his omnipresence. He is only in one place at one time while he lives upon this earth, not in all places at the same moment. The fifth I will not read any references for because it is again so obvious. He does not come to this earth with the glory he had with the Father before the world was, did he? Or none of us on this earth could even have looked in his face. So glory is left behind. Five things that he leaves behind that he does not operate with. Omnipresence, memory of the past, foreknowledge of the future, omnipresence, and glory. 
all of those attributes of God which make him function as God by divine right, those are his. He relinquishes, he empties himself, and there's a, a crucial reason. The reason God cannot be tempted, as James 1 says, is because God knows all things and from beginning. There is no question of his lack of knowledge on any point. The reason you and I can be tested or tempted by Satan is because we do not have knowledge. All you and I have is faith. Have you greeted God face to face? Have you stood in the heavenly courts to make sure there is a, a, another world? Have you been at the second coming yet? All of those are matters of faith. Faith in the word of God is given to you, not of knowledge. Do you see? And that faith can be challenged. That faith can be tested. Knowledge cannot be tested. Faith can be tested. And if Jesus would have come down to this earth using his omniscient mind, there would have been no possibility of a test. And Satan would never have gone into the wilderness and said, if thou be the Son of God, turn these stones into bread. That was only valid if Jesus' knowledge was left behind and he was operating only on faith in his Father's word who had said, this is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. And Satan was saying, you don't look like the Father's Son to me. You look a little like that angel that was cast down out of heaven a long time ago. And, and Satan was challenging Jesus' faith in the Father's word. That's why it's crucial that we understand that Jesus does not operate, that he does not function with the attributes of God during his life on earth because it is faith that is tested. Knowledge is not testable. So the first thing I want to put on the board is that Jesus' deity is not functioning during his life on earth. That aspect of Jesus' inherent godness, his deity, does not operate. It is inactive during his life on earth until the moment of the resurrection when the test is over and it returns to its full activity. Now to the key question of this afternoon's discussion, the important discussion that we need to, to move into. Is it clear from the Bible and the spirit of prophecy that Jesus took, in fact, a fallen nature, not the unfallen nature that Adam had before he sinned? Can we show that clearly? I could take time to read a number of Bible texts. There are some in the book of Hebrews that are very powerful, that he was made like his brethren in every respect, of the seed of David, of the seed of Abraham, according to the flesh. I have chosen only two texts because I believe that a careful analysis and understanding of these two texts should settle the issue. Please turn to Romans 8.3 first, Romans 8.3, and then back to Philippians chapter 2, verse 7. Romans 8, 3, first of all. This is one of the classic texts about the incarnation of Jesus. It is one that has engendered much discussion over the past years. Romans 8, 3 says what the law could not do in that it was weak through the flesh, God sending his own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin, condemn sin in the flesh. Now the key passage, God sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh. And as Elder Sequera pointed out quite correctly, sinful flesh is equivalent to, in Paul's writing, sinful nature. In fact, some translations give it that way. It is not just the flesh we have, it is the internal tendency passed down from Adam's fall, which are all a part of our fallen nature. And so sinful flesh here means sinful nature. Now it says God sent his own son in the likeness of this sinful nature. What does that mean? The likeness, how much has been said on that word likeness over recent years. What is the implication of it? What is it really trying to convey? Brothers and sisters, there are two options that I've been able to discover that likeness can mean. The first option, likeness means really or actually. That's the first option. In that sense, it would mean that God sent his own son in the actual sinful flesh or in real sinful flesh. That's option number one. Option number two, likeness means similar to but not the same as. 
That's the second option. And that would mean that God sent his own son in a similitude of sinful flesh, but not actual sinful flesh. There were similarities, but it was not really sinful flesh in the way you and I have sinful flesh. That's the second option. Which option is correct? I don't want a poll, brothers and sisters. <laughs> it's good to answer a question, and I'm glad you're listening, but that is not the way we solve the issue, is it? Is that the way we solve Bible truth, by seeing how many hands are raised to a particular point? That's the way we've been doing it in some cases, and I think that's part of our problem, isn't it? We have been taking polls about what the Bible teaches on various subjects, and I could name quite a few that have come into, into prominence recently. Now, how do we solve whether option number one or option number two is correct? Only by the Word of God is it safe to solve this dilemma. And let's find out if the Word of God will help us. Let's go to Philippians chapter 2, verse 7, the same verse we started with, but now the last half of the verse, and you'll see something very important. Philippians chapter 2 verse 7. Here it says he emptied himself and took upon him the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of man. Guess what? We're in luck. We don't have to go back to the Greek and figure out different Greek words. The word likeness in Philippians 2 7 is the same Greek word as likeness in Romans 8 3. Both in English and in Greek it is exactly alike. All right? And so it says here, he was made in the likeness of men. It's the same kind of context, likeness of sinful flesh in one place, likeness of men here. Two options. Jesus is made in real human flesh and blood, real humanity. Or option number two, Jesus is made in the similitude of human flesh and blood, like it but not the same as human flesh and blood. Now, I can just see you itching to say again what you think the correct answer is, and I'm pretty sure you think you know what it is. But once again, let's not make our decision by the best judgment we have, you see? Let's see if the Bible will help us on this point. You see, if I'd have asked this question in the first century BC, A.D., after Christ had lived on this earth, there wouldn't have been quite the quick response that you're ready to give right now as an answer to this question. There would have been a great deal of discussion and difference of opinion over option number one or option number two. Because there were some Christians who had come out of paganism, who had accepted Jesus Christ, who weren't at all certain about how Jesus came into this world. You see, they had come into, this, into, into Christianity believing in Jesus, but as is so typical of us, carrying a little baggage along with them from their past. One of the basic tenets of paganism is that the body, anything material, is evil, sinful. Only the spirit, the mind, is good. The, 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 the dualism, the dichotomy between body and spirit was crucial. It still is in paganism. It still is. The very essence of reincarnation, is, the, is that, that's the bottom line of it. Because, you see, you must go through several life experiences to work out the karmas of past experiences so that gradually the spirit is being purified. And finally, the ultimate blessing is when the body can be shed immediately, this old evil body, and the spirit can go into ultimate nirvana and find peace. It's the same teaching. It hasn't changed a bit down through the centuries. And this is what these Christians had come out of, but they hadn't come out of it all the way. They still believed that the body was evil and the spirit was good. And here come the apostles and the disciples preaching that Jesus Christ has come in flesh and blood and in horror. They said that can't be because that would make Jesus a sinner, a sinner. And he himself would need a savior. Have you heard that before? And that's a crucial point. We cannot have Jesus as a sinner if he is to be our Savior. You cannot have the two together. And these early Christians said, wait a minute. We cannot have Jesus in real flesh and blood. God does not come down and live in, in, in material, a material body. And so their solution was option number two in Philippians 2.7. 
Jesus came in the similitude of a human body. It looked like a human body. It felt like a human body. It ate food like a human body. If you touched it, it felt like a human body. But it was not a body at all. It was the ultimate illusion of the universe. Jesus took a phantom body. And they believed with all their heart and soul to protect the sinlessness of Jesus. You see? Keep in mind their motive. To protect Jesus' sinlessness. To protect a premise which was inherently false in its foundation but they thought was true. And to keep Jesus from being tainted with sin. They said that Jesus could not take a real flesh and blood human body. Now, how are we going to tell whether this is a correct or an incorrect belief? Once again from Scripture, John lived longer than any of the other apostles, some 30 to 40 years after Paul's ministry. And he met the full brunt of this teaching head on in his churches in Ephesus and in other places. And in 1 John chapter 4, he gives the strongest denunciation you will ever find against the teaching about this particular teaching. 1 John chapter 4, verse 2. Hereby know ye the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesseth that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh is of God. And every spirit that confesseth not that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh is not of God. And this is that spirit of Antichrist, whereof ye have heard that it should come, and even now already is it in the world. Isn't that a strong statement? the strongest possible warning against the teaching. And John was responding to the teaching of these docetists, these earnest Christians who wanted to protect the sinlessness of Jesus, and in doing so denied his flesh and blood humanity. And he is saying the way to test between truth and error is to ask the question, did Jesus Christ come in a real human body? And if the answer is yes, it is from the Spirit of God. If not, it's from Antichrist, even though it comes out of the lips of sincere Christians. You see? And so what is our scriptural answer to the question of Philippians 2.7? Option 1 or option 2? 1, isn't it? Clear from Scripture. It's absolute. Because here it must mean that Jesus is made actually man. Really man fully man. Do you see? Likeness means actual or real. Now, you see where I'm going. Back to Romans chapter 8, verse 3. The same word in the same type of context, but now referring not to flesh and blood as a body, but here referring to fallen nature. That's the difference, and that's the only difference. Everything else is identical. And here it says that he came in the likeness of sinful flesh or sinful nature. If the only meaning, the only biblical meaning of likeness in Philippians 2.7 is actual, then I submit to you, brothers and sisters, that the only biblical meaning of likeness in Romans 8.3 is also actual or real, or else I know not how to read language at all. I cannot follow language to proper conclusions in any logic whatsoever. In Philippians and Romans, likeness means real. It means actual. And Jesus took real or actual sinful flesh. Why did Paul use the word likeness then? Because Paul himself knew that there were some things that he could never say Jesus was exactly like man. What man had lived before he came onto this earth? What man chose his own parents? What man was born of the Holy Spirit as a father? And so Paul knew that there were some inherent differences by the very fact of Jesus' pre-existence. And the best word Paul could use is the word likeness, which does not mean unlikeness. That's the problem, isn't it? We have been translating it recently as unlikeness. No, it means likeness, as close as possible in every way, so that it is the real thing, even though Jesus lives before he comes down to this earth. And so I submit to you that Romans 8, 3 and Philippians 2, 7 tell us that Jesus came in real sinful flesh if we're going to understand language properly. Now, in addition to the evidence here, I'd like to share with you some evidence from the spirit of prophecy that I have found. Desire of Ages 49 is the most important statement, and I'll start with that. 
Desire of Ages 49. It would have been an almost infinite humiliation for the Son of God to take man's nature even when Adam stood in his innocence in Eden. But Jesus accepted humanity when the race had been weakened by 4,000 years of sin. Like every child of Adam. Are you a child of Adam? Like every child of Adam, he accepted the results of the working of the great law of heredity. What these results were is shown in the history of his earthly ancestors. He came with such a heredity to share our sorrows and temptations and to give us the example of a sinless life. Now, of course, the key phrase here, like every child of Adam, he accepted the results of the working of the great law of heredity. And you can check back, she says, to his earthly ancestors to see what these results were. He came with such a heredity. Now, some among us are saying that he came with the physical heredity of man after the fall, but not the moral heredity or the spiritual heredity of man after the fall. And I would only submit to you that if that would be true for me, then it possibly could be true for Jesus, that I have only the physical results of the fall, not the emotional results of the fall, not the moral results of the fall, not any of the other effects that, that, uh, that impinge upon my character. Is that true for you or me? No, it is not. We receive a total package, physical, mental, and moral. And here it says that Jesus came with such a heredity. May I suggest you put together with Desire of Ages 49 a simple, short little statement that I found in Patriarchs and Prophets, page 80. While Adam was created sinless in the likeness of God, Seth, like Cain, inherited the fallen nature of his parents. Now let's look at that for just a moment. Seth inherited fallen nature. It doesn't say physical fallen nature. It just says fallen nature, doesn't it? That includes all of the aspects of fallen nature. Seth inherited fallen nature. Who is an ancestor of Jesus Christ? Seth. Seth is an ancestor of Jesus Christ. In Desire of Ages 49, it says what these results were is shown in the history of his earthly ancestor. We could read what these results were is shown in the history of Seth's heredity. He, Christ, came with such a heredity. What heredity? Fallen nature. Do you see? Seth inherited fallen nature, not unfallen nature from Adam and Eve. Christ came with such a heredity seems to me the Desire of Ages 49 and Patriarchs and Prophets, page 80, should again settle the question, because Jesus accepts the working of the great law of heredity, as all the ancestors of his received it, and also Seth, as listed in this passage. I'm going to suggest there is much, much more in heredity than just mental and, uh, and physical attributes, and I'm going to read a couple of them for you. Patriarchs and Prophets, page 561. Both parents transmit their own characteristics, mental and physical, their dispositions and appetites to their children. Dispositions are more than a physical characteristic, aren't they? In the little book, A Solemn Appeal, page 45, excuse me, page 64, is this statement. Children generally inherit the peculiar traits of character which the parents possess. That's more than, the, than how tall you'll be or what your color of your eyes are, you see. The peculiar traits of character which the parents possess. Another one. Patriarchs and Prophets 118. As a rule, children inherit the dispositions and tendencies of their parents. Children inherit the dispositions and tendencies of their parents. Testimony, Volume 9, 222. There are those who have inherited peculiar tempers and dispositions. Testimony, Volume 4, page 30 and 31. He, the father, not the mother, the father transmits irritable tempers, polluted blood, enfeebled intellects, and weak morals to his children. Testimonies, Volume 3, page 567. Parents may have transmitted to children tendencies to appetite and passion tendencies. Testimony, volume 4, page 439, it will be well to remember that tendencies of character are transmitted from parents to children. 
Are we even going to begin to suggest that Jesus had no tendencies of character which were negative in his earthly ancestors? That would be an impossible statement, wouldn't it? Of course he had people that had all the range of tendencies that we see in our world today. Remember, his mother had a father and a mother. And they had fathers and mothers. So Jesus had a maternal grandfather, even though he didn't have an earthly father himself. But he was born through a line which contained fathers and mothers alike. And the genetic traits were transmitted down each successive line to Mary. And Mary then passed them on to Jesus. Of course, the only possible way that there could be any breakage in the line of heredity between Mary and Jesus would be in some form, either Catholic or Protestant, of the Immaculate Conception. Because the Immaculate Conception teaches that there was a break somewhere in the line of heredity. Either in Mary's birth or in the Protestant version in Jesus' birth. It doesn't matter where you put it. It's the same principle. If the line of heredity is broken at any point, then Jesus does not inherit what every other child inherits. And that's the essence of the teaching of the Immaculate Conception. If we are not going to believe in any form of the Immaculate Conception, and that's the question that our brothers Jones and Wagner asked at times, are we really out of the Catholic Church? If we are going to say no to the, to the Immaculate Conception, then we must say that Jesus inherited whatever Mary would, by natural heredity, pass on to any of her children, Jesus included. And then we don't have to resort to the Immaculate Conception to suggest that Jesus would inherit an unfallen nature from a fallen mother. A couple of other statements. I'm not going to read so many of them that are pertinent, but in the interest of time, to just select a few. Story of Redemption, page 45. Satan, he Satan, told his angels that when Jesus should take fallen man's nature, he could overpower him. Satan was confident that when Jesus would take fallen man's nature, he would have the victory. Story of Redemption 44, he would take man's fallen nature. Uh, the great work of redemption could be carried out only by the Redeemer taking the place of fallen Adam. That's Review and Herald, February 24, 1874. Why is that true? Why is it true that the work of redemption, the work of saving mankind, could be carried out only by the Redeemer taking the place of fallen Adam and not just taking his place, but taking his fallen nature, as we've just read. Why is that true? There's a crucial issue at stake here. And I'd like to share with you an issue now that is sometimes not talked about. We hear often that Jesus had to answer this question. Could Adam, in his unfallen state, have remained in obedience to the law of God? That's the question Jesus came to answer, we're told. Adam need not have sinned. Jesus came to prove that Adam need not have sinned. I'm going to suggest that that is not the issue at stake at all. And I'm going to read what the issue at stake is, not tell you what it is. Selected Messages, Volume 3, page 136. Satan, the fallen angel, had declared that no man could keep the law of God after the disobedience of Adam. He claimed the whole race under his control. What was his claim? That Adam couldn't keep the law of God? Or that no man could keep the law of God after Adam had fallen? That's the claim that Satan is placing against God's character. And then this statement from Signs of the Times, January 16, 1896. I believe it's also Selected Messages, Volume 1, page 252. Satan declared that it was impossible for the sons and daughters of Adam to keep the law of God. Who are the sons and daughters of Adam? You and me. We could not keep the law of God and thus charged upon God a lack of wisdom and love. If they, sons and daughters, could not keep the law, then there was fault with the lawgiver. You see, what we're hearing is that if Adam couldn't obey the law in his unfallen state, then God was at fault. No, that's not Satan's charge, according to this. If fallen human beings could not obey the law, then God is a faulty lawgiver. 
And then she says, Jesus humbled himself, clothing his divinity with humanity in order that he might stand as the head and representative of the human family and by both precept and example condemn sin in the flesh and give the lie to Satan's charges. Jesus comes to prove Satan a liar. Mark that. That's the great issue and the great controversy. Who is telling the truth, God or Satan? That's more important than whether you and I are saved. Whether God or Satan is telling the truth, that's the issue on which this whole universe hangs. And every living organism in the universe will live or die on the basis of whether God is telling the truth or not. Jesus comes to earth to give the lie to Satan's charges. Would he give the lie to Satan's charges if he answers something that Satan is not charging? What is Satan charging? If fallen human beings cannot obey the law, God is a bad lawgiver. What is the only way that Jesus can prove Satan a liar? Showing that fallen human beings can obey the law. Isn't that clear? That's the only way that he can refute Satan's charges. Let me read further. Review and Herald, March 9, 1905. He came to this world to be tempted in all points as we are, to prove to the universe that in this world of sin, human beings can live lives that God will approve. Satan declared that human beings could not live without sin. Human beings where? In this world of sin. That was Satan's claim. Human beings in this world of sin could not live without sin. And that means with a fallen nature. He came to prove that human beings could live without sin. You see? And one more. My Life Today, page 323. Revealing to the heavenly universe to Satan and to all the fallen sons and daughters of Adam that through the grace that that through his grace humanity can keep the law of God. Who's he proving it to? All the fallen sons and daughters of Adam. That through his grace humanity can keep the law of God. What humanity? You see? The sons and daughters of Adam. That's what he's coming to reveal to prove. I'm going to suggest that if Jesus takes actually the unfallen nature of Adam, that beautiful nature in tune with the Father, doing the Father's will as naturally as eating or breathing, if he takes that nature, then no one to this day has refuted Satan's charge. And the great controversy is still up for grabs. No one yet has thrown down Satan's arguments. His argument is a fallen human being cannot obey God's law. God, you gave a bad law. You are the fault of their disobedience. It's not their fault. It's your fault. And if Jesus came in Adam's nature before the fall, no one yet has refuted that charge. That's the issue at stake, brothers and sisters. That's why it is so critical to some of us to say what we really feel the Bible teaches about the nature of Jesus Christ, even though we realize it is very sensitive today. And even though it costs us, and it will cost. But we must take the position of Scripture, not the position of philosophy on this point, not the position of protecting a false premise. I will go one step farther here. Remember I said that the Docetists in the first century were protecting their idea, their false premise, that the body is evil, and so they came up with this solution that Jesus didn't have a real body. I am going to suggest that the major reason we had changed from our previous unanimous opinion in the church, in the Seventh-day Adventist church, that Jesus took the fallen nature of man, and we have changed to saying that he took the unfallen nature of man, the reason for that is an honest reason. It is an attempt to protect the sinlessness of Jesus. That's the reason for it. It is an honest attempt to keep Jesus from a taint of sin because of a premise, and that premise is sinful nature equals sin. Sinful nature equals a sinner. When I am born with a sinful nature, I am a sinner. And to protect Jesus from being a sinner, we have to say that Jesus is not born like we are. He is born with an unfallen nature. That's the reason for the shift in Adventist thinking over the past 30 to 40 years is an honest attempt to keep Jesus from being a sinner. 
the same honest attempt of the first century Docetists, both protecting an erroneous premise. The first century to protect the idea that to have a body is to be a sinner. Our 20th century idea that to have a sinful nature is to be a sinner. And I submit both are erroneous premises, and we have built a doctrine of Jesus Christ to accommodate that erroneous premise in both cases. Now let's go back to the evidence. Let me just uh, divert for just a little bit to non-inspired evidence, just to give you a little hint that this is not all one-sided. Right in our own Bible commentary, the non-inspired portion, the regular Bible comments, Bible commentary, volume 6, page 562, is this statement. Christ met, overcame, and condemned sin in the sphere in which it had previously exercised its dominion and mastery. The flesh, the scene of sin's former triumphs now became the scene of its defeat and expulsion. Well, let me just ask a simple question. In what sphere had sin exercised dominion? In Adam before the fall or after Adam after the fall? It's Adam after the fall where sin exercises dominion and mastery. And that's the scene of sin's former triumphs. Christ met, overcame, and condemned sin in the sphere in which it had previously exercised mastery. So I'm suggesting that it is not all one-sided. This is a scholarly statement to say that Jesus came where we are, not where Adam was. Bible Commentary, Volume 6, page 562, on this point. I'm trying to decide what to leave out. I want to say this one more thing about uh, this, this point. It is a bit interesting that in the Reformed theologies among Adventists in the 70s, there have been many statements, all-encompassing statements that have been put out, such as, no scholar believes that sanctification is ever part of righteousness by faith. That's a statement we've heard a few times. Or, no scholar takes the position that Jesus assumed fallen, sinful human nature. Or, no scholar believes that Romans 8, 1-4 teaches that Jesus came in the same fallen flesh as all other men. And because these statements have been made flatly, confidently, and with a scholar's authority behind them, most of us have assumed they must be true. I think that's what has happened in our conditioning over the past few years. The statements have been made authoritatively, and so we've assumed that those who have said them must have the evidence to back them up. All right, back to the inspired evidence. Selected Messages, Volume 3, page 134. By thus taking humanity, he honored humanity. Having taken our fallen nature, he showed what it might become. He didn't take Adam's beautiful nature and show what it might become. He took degraded nature and showed what it might become. Mark this down. There is a vast difference between Adam's nature before the fall and Adam's nature after the fall. Before the fall, Adam's nature was so in tune with his father's will that obedience flowed naturally out of him. He had to work to disobey. He really had to fight with that nature to ever disobey. Adam, after the fall, found it natural to do what when the Lord came looking for him? Run and hide. And when the Lord asked him a question, what came naturally? Blaming someone else. Do you see what had happened in this nature? The nature which just flowed in, forth in obedience now flowed forth in disobedience. And his nature now was, was, it was as easy for him to disobey as it was for him to eat or drink or breathe. That's the difference between Adam before or after the fall. The question is, how was it with Jesus? Did Jesus find it just natural and easy to obey, or did Jesus have something within him that was a fight and a mark every step of his, of his life? That's the issue at stake. A couple of other statements. Christ took upon him fallen, suffering human nature, degraded and defiled by sin. Bible, uh, uh, Bible Commentary, Volume 4, page 1147. Degraded and defiled. And lest we think, oh, but doesn't that make Christ a sinner? Doesn't that contaminate him? Don't go by your feelings when discussing the Word of God. Go by the Word of God. Are you to wait until you feel saved to say the Lord has saved me from sin? Or are you to believe that he has saved you because he has promised? 
And in this case, are we going to feel that we are sinners because there is something negative about ourselves, or are we going to let the Lord tell us when we are sinners? And the same issue applies. No, having these things as equipment is not to be a sinner. It's what we do with them that makes the difference. It's how we respond to them. Listen to this. Though he had all the strength of passion of humanity, never did he yield to temptation to do one single act. All the strength of passion inside him. In heavenly places, 155. And then this statement, and this is a crucial one. This is when he is being tested in the, in the um, trials, and he is being attacked physically and mentally. Christ was put to the closest test requiring the strength of all his faculties to resist the inclination when in danger to use his power to deliver himself from peril and to triumph over the power of the prince of darkness. Satan showed his knowledge of the weak points of the human heart and put forth his utmost power to take advantage of the weakness of the humanity which Christ had assumed. What was the weakness? What was the weak part of the human heart? That inclination to defend his ego. That was the weak part. Isn't that your weak part and mine? The inclination to defend self is the strongest thing there is in us. And we see it arising at every turn. And here was the inclination to use his power to deliver himself and defeat Satan. And I would suggest, too, that in John 5.30, Jesus means what he said. Remember what we read? I come not to do my own will, but the will of my Father. Remember what he said at the Garden of Gethsemane? Lord, take this cup away from me, yet not my will. What was his will? Walk away. Leave it. Don't become the sin bearer. That's what his will said to him. And he had to say, no, I can't trust my will. My will is out of a fallen nature, and it can never be trusted. I have to trust your will, Father. Your will does not, my will does not always agree with your will by inherent nature. I have to subjugate it to your will. That's what he was saying in John 5, 30. Listen to this. The human will of Christ would not have led him to the wilderness of temptation to fast and to be tempted of the devil. It would not have led him to endure humiliation, scorn, reproach, suffering, and death. His human nature shrank from all these things as decidedly as ours shrinks from them. Do you delight? to go into difficult situations, to face persecution and opposition? No, your human will says, I'd rather be comfortable. And you have to say, I submit my will to yours, Father. If you want me to go, I'll go. And that's exactly what Jesus did. What did Christ live to do? It was the will of his heavenly Father. That signs of the times, October 29, 1894. The human will of Christ and the divine will were not the same. One had to be subjected to the other. The human will of Christ was part of the package that Jesus received when he became a man in fallen nature. He was made like unto his brethren with the same susceptibilities, mental and physical. He was tempted in all points like as we are yet without sin. Same susceptibilities. Are you susceptible to losing your temper when you're tired? Are you susceptible to being jealous when someone is passed over you for a promotion? It doesn't mean you will be jealous, does it? But are you susceptible to it? It's very real to have the feeling come. Yes, you are susceptible to it because of a fallen nature. If you had an unfallen nature, you would not be susceptible to it because you would praise the other person for the, for, for the favor that has been granted to him. And so here, this is Review and Herald, February 10, 1885 with the same susceptibilities that we have. And then one other one I'll share. Review and Herald, July 17, 1900. Christ did in reality unite the offending nature of man with his own sinless nature. Was Adam's nature before the fall an offending nature? No. Only after the fall. And he united the offending nature of man with his own sinless nature. Now the result of this teaching, and here is the crucial result of it. This is why it was taught so strongly in the 1888 message. Here is the reason for it. And this comes out in a letter to an 18-year-old young person in 1878. It's letter 17. You will find parts of it in our high calling, pages 57 and 59. Christ, Jesus once stood in age just where you now stand. 
who? An 18-year-old. Your circumstances, your cogitations, at this period of your life, Jesus has had. Do you understand that? Can you think back to your 18-year-old experience? Was everything all settled in your life? Did you have everything all put together? Was your value system complete? Or were you a bit perplexed about right and wrong, issues of truth and error, God and Satan? Your cogitation at this period of your life, Jesus has had. He is acquainted with your temptation. His mind, like yours, could be harassed and perplexed. Perplexed. If you have hardship, so did he. You have not a difficulty that did not press with equal weight upon him, not a sorrow that his heart has not experienced. His feelings could be hurt with neglect, with indifference of professed friends as easily as yours. Is your pathway thorny? Christ was so in a tenfold sense. Are you distressed? So was he. How well fitted was Christ to be an example. You see what we've learned? First, Christ had to meet Satan's charges in the great controversy. He had to vindicate the name of God. And that demanded the fallen nature. Second, he has to show us how to deal with our peculiar situations because we are born in the fallen nature as an example. And that demands the fallen nature. It is not just one issue. It is the accumulation of many issues at stake here. To redeem and to show us the way. Both factors are crucial at this point. And so Jesus has walked in our shoes. That's the bottom line. He has walked in every step we have taken. And that's why it was stressed during the 1888 period. We don't have to stumble along wondering if we can or overcome or not. We have only to watch the one who did. And we know that God can provide the power. If no one has ever overcome in a fallen human nature, then I haven't the slightest chance of doing it today. There is no way that I am ever going to live a sinless life in the fear of God and pass through the time of the plague if no one has showed me how to do it. But thank goodness there has been one who has walked there before me. And I never take one footstep, but I put it right in the place where he has stepped. Never a thought that comes to me that I need ask, has Jesus never had that thought? Because he has. He has experienced our temptations. And so I would put now the next part of our outline on the board, that he has a fallen nature just as we do. first line refers to Jesus, the second line refers to us. The heredity is the same. That's the point of stress. And yet we haven't answered our entire problem. Jesus is not exactly as we are. And here's where the difficulties have come up over the past few years. We can't end our discussion right here because there is something about Jesus that is different. There is a different aspect. Most of the difficulty that has come to us in the last 30 years most of the confusion, most of the questions have arisen from one letter. A few have come from some isolated statements, but most of the confusion has arisen from one letter written to a man named Baker in Tasmania off Australia. It, you find it reprinted in Bible Commentary, Volume 5, pages 1128 and 1129, and I won't read the entire letter, but just the crucial part. Be careful, exceedingly careful as to how you dwell upon the human nature of Christ. Do not set him before the people as a man with the propensities of sin. He is the second Adam. That's the first part of the statement. Near the end of that paragraph, she says, he could have sinned, he could have fallen, but not for one moment was there in him an evil propensity. And then farther on, never in any way leave the slightest impression upon human minds that a taint of or inclination to corruption rested upon Christ. Let every human being be warned from the ground of making Christ altogether human, such an one as ourselves, for it cannot be. Do you see the difficulty? Do you see why the confusion has arisen? Taken at face value without any background at all, it sounds very much like Jesus was not at all born like we are. Now I'm going to suggest once again that neither the spirit of prophecy nor the Bible contradict themselves. I have the belief that when Paul talks about law in one place, 
And when he talks about law in another place, he does not contradict himself, even though he sounds like he does. Have you noticed? The law is beautiful and holy and good, oh, but not under the law, under grace. The letter kills, the spirit gives life. Have you been puzzled by those? Paul does not contradict himself. When he is talking of the law as a method, it is beautiful and whole as a standard. It is beautiful and holy and good. When he's talking of the law as a method to achieve salvation, it is always legalism and wrong. Law as a standard is beautiful. Law as method is wrong. And Paul makes perfect sense with himself. Even Paul and James do not contradict, do they? Because they're fighting a different enemy. And it sounds like they say the opposite thing. No. Scripture, inspiration, harmonizes. It's our job to find the harmony, not simply say, oh, well, there's a contradiction. Let's forget it. Let's not study it anymore. I believe that we have harmony here. I believe we have solutions. It is just our job to try to find these solutions and see if they make sense. I'm going to suggest to you, and I can't possibly give you all the evidence here, but only a conclusion, that the word propensity does not always mean what the dictionary defines it to be, that which is inherited. That's the bottom line. There are times when Ellen White uses the word propensity to mean what is inherited, a tendency. She does. There are times also when she uses the word propensity to mean that which is not inherited. And I'm going to give you an example or two of this. Seven Bible Commentary, page 943. We need not retain one sinful propensity. Now, just think for a moment. That fallen nature that you and I have, how long do we keep it? Until Christ's second coming. Can we get rid of it at the close of probation? The ceiling? Latter rain? Those are some of the problems we've fallen into in past years, correct? And I hope we're away from those errors. No, we retain basic fallen equipment until the second coming of Jesus Christ. Even Paul did right to the day of his death. That's why he said he pressed on. All right. If that is true, if we keep fallen heredity until the day of our death, then can sinful propensity be identical to fallen heredity if we need not retain one sinful propensity here and now? You see, they can't be the same. You can get rid of every sinful propensity that you have right now, is the teaching that we're reading here. Every one. But you keep your fallen nature. Now let me read a little farther. Self-indulgence, self-pleasing, pride, and extravagance must be renounced. We cannot be Christians and gratify these propensities. That comes from Review and Herald, May 16, 1893. What is a propensity here? Self-indulgence, self-pleasing, pride, and extravagance. What are those? Character traits. Habit patterns. Developed habit patterns. That's the meaning of propensity in this passage and a sense in which Ellen White uses it quite often. And usually when she puts the word sinful or evil in front of it, she is referring to this developed habit pattern. One other statement, and there are several, but I can't take time to read them all. Although their evil propensities may seem to them as precious as the right hand or the right eye, they must be separated from the worker or he cannot be acceptable before God. Testimonies to Ministers 171 and 172. What's the only thing you can separate from you? Character traits and habit patterns. The Holy Spirit does the separating. But you cannot separate your nature from you. You can separate your character traits by the grace of God. And so it is character traits or habit patterns that must be separated. These are the evil propensities. Another statement. Make a constant effort to curb bad tempers and evil propensities. They have grown with your growth. What's an evil propensity? It's similar to a bad temper. You see? Testimonies, Volume 5, page 335. So I'm going to suggest that there is a very distinct usage in the spirit of prophecy of propensities to mean not what is inherited, but what is developed through cultivation. A cultivated habit pattern and may I suggest that that, if read back into this statement, solves our dilemma. Let me read it that way in the statement I just read from Bible Commentary, Volume 5. Do not set him before the people as a man 
with the habit patterns of sin. I believe that that's what this man Baker was teaching over in Australia. That Jesus had developed these habit patterns during his young life. And only at the moment of his anointing with the Holy Spirit was he proclaimed the Messiah. But he had already developed all the habit patterns. And she's warning against that. Do not, for not for one moment, was there in him an evil habit pattern. There was no pride in Christ. There was no extravagance in Christ. Never leave the slightest impression that a taint or inclination to corruption rested upon Christ. A taint of corruption is disloyalty. That's what corruption is. Not bad equipment. Disloyalty is what corrupts us. Let every human being be warned from the ground of making Christ altogether human, such in one as ourselves, for it cannot be. He did not develop as we develop. That's the bottom line. And so the next part of our charge will come into play. At the moment of birth, we begin to develop our fallen tendencies into habit patterns or sinful propensities. We cultivate them. We encourage them. Jesus, at the moment of birth, did not develop or cultivate tendencies to become habit patterns. He was not altogether a such an one as us. Jesus develop differently. What I'm trying to say is he inherits what, he, what we inherit. He does not develop as we develop. Fallen nature, yes. Character, no. You see? And so the crucial point is the development. And lest you say that gives Christ an advantage, I simply would ask you, are you really sure you know what advantage means? How many people was Jesus responsible for in this universe? The whole universe. How many sins could he commit and maintain his mission? Did he have a mediator in the courts of heaven to help him out when he got in trouble? How many people are you and I with our sinful propensities responsible for? One ultimately. How many sins can we commit and still find entrance into eternal life? You're not counting too well right now. Do you and I have a mediator in the courts of heaven ready to help us whenever we get into trouble? Who has the advantage in the whole situation? Do you see? There are differences in the birth of Jesus by the fact that he had a pre-existent life, that he came down to this earth with a specific mission in mind. There are differences, yes, but advantage, no. Because you know what? The same method that Jesus had for overcoming sin is available to us, and you know what it is. Our method is the new birth of the Holy Spirit. How did Jesus have victory over sin? The same Holy Spirit that comes to us in the new birth. You see? The same methodology that Jesus used in his life is available in our life. And when we begin to exercise the power inherent in the new birth, we begin to undevelop the fallen sinful propensity. The character traits begin to reverse and they are removed from us as Jesus never had them. And so the end result in us can be exactly the same as it was in Jesus' life. Now, I believe it was the Holy Spirit that kept these propensities from developing in Jesus, just the way the Holy Spirit helps us to remove those propensities. That Jesus had the same Holy Spirit available to him as you and I do. Now, one other step. As you know, there is a very strong statement in Hebrews chapter 4, verse 15. Hebrews 4.15 says, and you know it well, that Jesus was tempted in all points like as we are, yet without sin. May I read a statement as to how we are tempted? It's the little book, Christ Tempted as We Are, page 11. His strongest, this is referring to me, his strongest temptations will come from within, for he must battle against his inclinations, the inclinations of the natural heart. Where do my strongest temptations come from? Out there somewhere? Or within my sinful nature? Isn't that the strongest fight you and I have to face? The inclinations that come from within are the strongest temptations that I will ever have to face. Now listen to this. If we had to bear anything which Jesus did not endure, then upon this point Satan would represent the power of God as insufficient for us. He endured every trial to which we are subject. 
Desire of Ages 24. Where do my strongest temptations come from? What if Jesus didn't have anything from within? No temptations from within at all because he had a perfect, unfallen nature. Then would he experience the strongest temptations I experience? He could not. Do you see? And then, really, Hebrews 4.15 would have to be retranslated. He was tempted in almost no points like I am tempted. Because Jesus is tempted in the strength of my temptation. He knows where the depth of, tempt, of, of, of temptation lies. And my strengths come from within. He endured every trial to which we are subject. And my greatest trials come from within. I don't know about yours, but mine do. Well, I'm not going to be able to read all of the ones that are very powerful and strong here. I'm going to skip over all of them. <laughs> We are too much in the habit of thinking that the Son of God was a being so entirely exalted above us that it is an impossibility for him to enter into our trials and temptations, that he can have no sympathy with us in our weaknesses and frailties. This is because we do not take in the fact of his oneness with humanity. He took upon him the likeness of sinful flesh and was made in all points like unto his brethren. We have come to believe that since Jesus' obedience was in an unfallen nature, I can never really obey fully. And we followed what Ellen White has said here. He's so much exalted above us that he really can't feel what I feel like when I'm hit with a hard one. That's Signs of the Times, May 16, 1895. And there are scores upon scores of statements that say exactly the fact that Jesus shared in an experiential way, not just a vicarious way, an experiential way, all the temptations common to men. Listen to one more. In our own strength, it is impossible for us to deny the clamors of our fallen nature. Through this channel, Satan will bring temptation upon us. Christ knew that the enemy would come to every human being to take advantage of hereditary weakness. Now put together those thoughts. The clamors of our fallen nature, temptation, hereditary weakness, they are identical. That's what the clamors of fallen nature are. They are not sin. They are temptation. Read James 1, 14 and 15. Clamors of fallen nature are temptations. And that hereditary weakness, hereditary weakness is not just physical. It's clamors of fallen nature. That's what hereditary weakness is. And by passing over the ground which man must travel, our Lord has prepared the way for us to overcome. There it is. What ground do I have to travel? Clamors, temptations, hereditary weakness. Jesus passed over that ground and thus gave me footsteps to walk in. Desire of Ages 122 and 123. From Selected Messages, Volume 1, page 95. The Son of God in his humanity wrestled with the very same fierce, apparently overwhelming temptations that assail men. Listen to what they are temptations to indulgence of appetite, to presumptuous venturing where God has not led them, and to the worship of the God of this world. Now those are the very same fierce, apparently overwhelming temptations that assail men. And where do they come from? Remember what we just read? The strength of our temptations comes from within. Those are attractive thoughts to us, aren't they? Eat a little bit more than you need. Just a little. Uh, take the easy way out. God is a little bit too hard on us. We can kind of relax a little more than he expects of us. Where does that feel good? It feels good in our fallen nature, doesn't it? The sinful flesh says, yes, yes. And we have to say, by the grace of God, no. The temptations are fierce and apparently overwhelming, and they come from within. And those are the ones Jesus had to face. Christ knows how strong are the inclinations of the natural heart. How does he know? He had them. He had the inclinations of the natural heart. Testimonies, Volume 5, page 177. And that's all I'll read on that point. How did Jesus overcome? What was his method of victory? Desire of Ages 363 is very specific and plain. 
As one with us, a sharer in our needs and weaknesses, he was wholly dependent upon God. And in the secret place of prayer, he sought divine strength that he might go forth braced for duty and trial. As a man, he supplicated the throne of God till his humanity was charged with a heavenly current that would connect humanity with divinity. Through continual communion, he received life from God that he might impart life to the world. That's the whole thing in a nutshell. How did Jesus have victory? He pleaded with his Father till his humanity was charged with a current from above that would connect humanity with divinity. But you say Jesus was God. No, he had left his deity aside now. He was God, but not using the powers of God. And to have the divine nature, it must be on the basis of constant communion with his Father. And it must be an acquired divine nature day by day by day by day. And if he doesn't pray, if he doesn't submit, he loses his, the divine nature just the way you do. And so we can add one more thing. In response to Jesus' surrender, prayer, commitment, the Father sends the Holy Spirit, the divine nature, and God-likeness. And it is this divine nature that keeps Jesus' fallen humanity from yielding to sin. By the constant surrender of his fallen nature to the divine nature, Jesus is a sinless Savior. And then do you notice the next statement, his experience is to be ours? In response to the same aspects of surrender, faith, commitment, God sends the Holy Spirit, the divine nature, and God life. It is very simple, the plan of salvation. Very simple. It's just hard for our carnal natures to, to yield to it. That's the only difficulty. But the plan is simple. It doesn't require theological training. It doesn't require a knowledge of Greek. All it requires is submission of heart. God doesn't even require intellectual knowledge to be saved. There is a necessity of intellectual knowledge to vindicate the name of God, yes. But to be saved, commitment and surrender, yielding of the heart, and God-likeness is the result, as he has promised. Listen to this. With the same facilities that man may obtain, he withstood the temptations of Satan as man must withstand them. Selected Messages, Volume 1, page 252. What facilities do you and I have? What facilities do we have? We have a fallen nature. We have a bad environment around us. A world not the way God planned. We have faith. We have surrender. We have prayer. We have Bible study with the same facilities that man may obtain. Can you and I ever obtain on this side of eternity an unfallen nature? With the same facilities man may obtain, he withstood the temptations of Satan. He has limited himself to our facilities, and one of them is not an unfallen nature. Another statement, he exercised in his own behalf no power that is not freely offered to us. As man, he met temptation and overcame him, the strength given him from God, desire of ages 24. Do you have the power of that magnificent nature of Adam before the fall? Would you like that power? Will you rejoice and praise the Lord when that power is yours? He exercised no power that is not freely offered to us here and now. That is not offered to us here and now. And it's a magnificent and terribly powerful experience to have an unfallen nature. Good equipment. The computer runs right. What a power that will be. And he exercised no power not freely offered to us. That's the promise. And so I suggest that we're not dealing with a complicated issue here, brothers and sisters. The evidence is clear. It is not muddled. It is not muddy. It is not inconclusive. We, can't, we, don't, we don't need to throw up our hands in despair in hopeless contradiction. It is a clear statement. Listen. If Christ had a special power, which it is not the privilege of men to have, Satan would have made capital of the matter. Don't you believe it? Selected Messages, Volume 3, page 139. 
If he had a power which you and I cannot have, Satan would have said, of course he obeyed, that's why. They still can't obey. Nobody has showed that. He would have made capital of the matter. And may I suggest one more thing. Jesus gained the victory through submission and faith in God. Desire of Ages 130. That's how you and I gain the victory. In our conclusions, we make many mistakes because of our erroneous views of the human nature of our Lord. When we give to his human nature a power that is not possible for man to have in his conflict with Satan, i.e. unfallen human nature, when we give to his human nature a power that it is not possible for man to have in his conflict with Satan, we destroy the completeness of his humanity. That's a strong warning, brothers and sisters. Seven Bible Commentary, page 929. And I would suggest that we are in extreme danger right now doing just that, of destroying the completeness of our, of our of Savior's humanity. And thus we're left to flounder on a sea of uncertainty as to whether or not God can perfect the people. Part of that same statement says, the Lord now demands that every son and daughter of Adam, that's you and me, serve him in human nature which we now have. Jesus could only keep the commandments of God in the same way that humanity can keep them. Human nature we now have. Well, that's enough of the statements on that point. But because we're gathered here in this conference, I've extended some of those statements to give you the heart and soul of the reason that I have become convicted that this is a matter not for backroom theological discussion, but a matter that every Seventh-day Adventist who is preparing for the second coming of Jesus Christ needs to have clearly settled in his mind. That we are not going to get to the second coming of Christ until we understand the implications of the humanity of Jesus Christ. What are some of those implications? They're, they're marvelous and they're powerful. Christ came to this world and lived the law of God that man might have perfect mastery over the natural inclinations which corrupt the soul. That's the power of it. Perfect mastery. Ministry of Healing, page 131. Perfect mastery. Christ came to live the law in his human character in just that way in which all may live the law in human nature if they will do as Christ was doing. Just the way. Selected Messages, Volume 3, page 130. And then this is almost beyond belief. It is the privilege of every believer in Christ to possess Christ's nature, a nature far above that which Adam forfeited by transgression. That's upward look, page 18. You know what that's saying? That's saying that we can have his nature because we experience what he has experienced, and that goes far beyond Adam because Adam failed. He was immature, and when the test came, he fell. We will have victory where Adam failed. And that's far above what Adam forfeited by transgression. Just that which you may be, he was in human nature. Praise God. He has given us a consecrated way to perfection. That's the words of our brother, isn't it, from 1888 on. He has not left us wondering if this is a possibility. He has not left us floundering, hoping that maybe there might be something. No, we have the concrete example in living flesh and blood that what God promises, he enables. When God says victory is possible and his law is a good law, it has been proved to all the universe that Satan is a liar, that God is a good lawgiver. And it was because of that that the last link of sympathy was broken between angels and Satan himself. Because the charges were refuted, Jesus Christ came and walked in our shoes that never again might we fear to take the next step. Praise his name. Amen? Amen? You know, some people say that this subject isn't that important, what we believe on it. It's very clear from the scriptures and spirit of prophecy what the truth is. What we must realize is our message to the world is the cleansing of the sanctuary, God preparing a people for translation, which includes, obviously, victory over sin. So when we start to come along and say that Christ didn't have our nature. That's Satan's deception in order to deceive us into believing we cannot have victory over sin. And it destroys our message of the cleansing of the sanctuary. 
That's what's at the heart of this. I want to add one other thought I forgot. If we just understand this doctrine intellectually, and we know what it means in our minds, and we can refute arguments, we can be just as lost as the Pharisees or anyone else. Amen. This doctrine is not to refute arguments, it's to change lives. Amen. And if our experience Amen. isn't being changed by this doctrine, we have lost the battle. Amen. Let's not take the arguments and shoot other people down with them. Let's see what they can do in our own lives. Amen. 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 One quick announcement. Um, our meeting tonight will start at 7 o'clock. We we're going we're gonna to have a question and answer period first, and then Elder Whelan will have our last meeting for this seminar. Let us stand for prayer. Our Heavenly Father, we do pray so much that as your Holy Spirit works in our lives and convicts us of sin and shows us how much you love us, may we surrender to that and we allow your Spirit to lead us to victory that will uplift and glorify our Savior. I pray in Jesus.